Welcome to Seneca's Morals. Human happiness is founded upon wisdom and virtue. Part 2 of 2. On words of wisdom. Seneca, also known as Seneca the Younger, was a prominent Roman philosopher, orator, statesman, and a tragedian author. He was considered Rome's leading intellectual figure during the mid-first century. Although born in Spain, Seneca spent most of his life in Rome, where he received his education in philosophy and rhetoric. In 50 CE, he took the position of tutor, then four years later as advisor to the fifth Roman emperor, Nero. Seneca's life work was strongly influential for generations to come. His ideas figured in the revival of Stoicism during the Renaissance when he was referred to as a sage admired and venerated as an oracle of moral, even of Christian edification, a master of literary style and a model for dramatic art. Seneca's philosophical works are important in that they initiated the further development of ancient Stoicism as we know it today. Apart from philosophical writings, his contributions included plays, tragedies, essays, and letters dedicated to moral issues. Today, we will continue with a selection from Seneca's philosophy from the book Seneca's Morals of a Happy Life, Benefits, Anger, and Clemency in Chapter 2 of the section Seneca of a Happy Life, the author elaborates on wisdom and her importance in benefiting humans with true perfect happiness and virtues. Chapter 2 Human happiness is founded upon wisdom and virtue, and first of wisdom. He that is perfectly wise is perfectly happy. Nay, the very beginning of wisdom makes life easy to us. Neither is it enough to know this unless we print it in our minds by daily meditation, and so bring a good will to a good habit. And we must practice what we preach, for philosophy is not a subject for popular ostentation, nor does it rest in words, but in things. It is not an entertainment taken up for the like or to give a taste to our leisure, but it fashions the mind, governs our actions, tells us what we are to do and what not. It sits at the helm and guides us through all hazards. Nay, we cannot be safe without it, for every hour gives us occasion to make use of it. It informs us in all duties of life, piety to our parents, faith to our friends, charity to the miserable, judgment in counsel. It gives us peace by fearing nothing, and riches by coveting nothing. There is no condition of life that excludes a wise man from discharging his duty. If his fortune be good, he tempers it. If bad, he masters it. If he has an estate, he will exercise his virtue in plenty, if none, in poverty. If he cannot do it in his country, he will do it in banishment. If he has no command, he will do the office of a common soldier. Some people have the skill of reclaiming the fiercest of beasts. They will make a lion embrace his keeper, a tiger kiss him, and an elephant kneel to him. This is the case of a wise man in the most extreme difficulties. Let them be never so terrible in themselves. When they come to him once, they are perfectly tame. They that ascribe the invention of tillage, architecture, navigation, etc., to wise men may perchance be in the right that they were invented by wise men as wise men. For wisdom does not teach our fingers, but our minds. Fiddling and dancing, arms and fortifications, were the works of luxury and discord, but wisdom instructs us in the way of nature and in the arts of unity and concord, not in the instruments, but in the government of life, not to make us live only, but to live happily. She teaches us what things are good, what evil, and what only appears so, and to distinguish betwixt true greatness and humor. She clears our minds of dross and vanity. She raises up our thoughts to heaven and carries them down to hell. She discourses of the nature of the soul 
the powers and faculties of it, the first principles of things, the order of providence. She exalts us from things corporeal to things incorporeal and retrieves the truth of all. She searches nature, gives laws to life, and tells us that it is not enough to God unless we obey Him. She looks upon all accidents as acts of providence, sets a true value upon things, delivers us from false opinions, and condemns all pleasures that are attended with repentance. She allows nothing to be good that would not be so forever, no man to be happy, but that needs no other happiness than what he has within himself. This is the felicity of human life, a felicity that can neither be corrupted nor extinguished. It inquires into the nature of the heavens, the influence of the stars, how far they operate upon our minds and bodies. Which thoughts, though they do not form our manners, they do yet raise and dispose us for glorious things. It is agreed upon all hands that right reason is the perfection of human nature, and wisdom only the dictate of it. The greatness that arises from it is solid and unmovable, the resolutions of wisdom being free, absolute and constant. Whereas folly is never long pleased with the same thing, but still shifting of counsels and sick of itself. There can be no happiness without constancy and prudence, for a wise man is to write without a blot, and what he likes once he approves forever. He admits of nothing that is either evil or slippery, but marches without staggering or stumbling and is never surprised. He lives always true and steady to himself, and whatsoever befalls him, this great artificer of both fortunes turns to advantage. He that demurs and hesitates is not yet composed, but wheresoever virtue interposes upon the main, there must be conquered and consent in the parts. For all virtues are in agreement, as well as all vices are at variance. A wise man, in what condition soever he is, will be still happy, for he subjects all things to himself, because he submits himself to reason, and governs his actions by counsel, not by passion. He is not moved with the utmost violence of fortune, nor with the extremities of fire and sword, whereas a fool is afraid of his own shadow and surprised at ill accidents, as if they were all leveled at him. He does nothing unwillingly, for whatever he finds necessary, he makes it his choice. He propounds to himself the certain scope and end of human life. He follows that which conduces to it, and avoids that which hinders it. He is content with his lot, whatever it be, without wishing what he has not, though of the two he had rather abound than want. The great business of his life, like that of nature, is performed without tumult or noise. He neither fears danger or provokes it, but it is his caution, not any want of courage. For captivity, wounds, and chains he only looks upon as false and lymphatic terrors. He does not pretend to go through with whatever he undertakes, but to do that well which he does. Arts are but the servants, wisdom commands, and where the matter fails, it is none of the workman's fault. He is cautelous in doubtful cases, in prosperity temperate, and resolute in adversity, still making the best of every condition and improving all occasions to make them serviceable to his fate. Some accidents there are, which I confess may affect him, but not overthrow him, as bodily pains, loss of children and friends, the ruin and desolation of a man's country. One must be made of stone or iron, not to be sensible of those calamities, and, besides, it were no virtue to bear them, if a body did not feel them. There are three degrees of proficiency in the school of wisdom. 
The first are those that come within sight of it, but not up to it. They have learned what they ought to do, but they have not put their knowledge in practice. They are past the hazard of a relapse, but they have still the grudges of a disease, though they are out of the danger of it. By a disease, I do understand an obstinacy in evil or an ill habit that makes us over-eager upon things which are either not much to be desired or not at all. A second sort are those that have subjected their appetites for a season, but are yet in fear of falling back. A third sort are those that are clear of many vices, but not of all. They are not covetous, but perhaps they are choleric, nor lustful, but perchance ambitious. They are firm enough in some cases, but weak enough in others. There are many that despise death, and yet shrink at pain. There are diversities in wise men, but no inequalities. One is more affable, another more ready, a third a better speaker, but the felicity of them all is equal. It is in this, as in heavenly bodies, there is a certain state in greatness. In civil and domestic affairs, a wise man may stand in need of counsel, as of a physician, an advocate, a solicitor, but in greater matters, the blessing of wise men rests in the joy they take in the communication of their virtues. If there were nothing else in it, a man would apply himself to wisdom, because it settles him in a perfect tranquility of mind. Brilliant viewers, we thank you for your kind presence for today's words of wisdom.